I was just going to show you, uh, talk about what you got here. And you, you were a Carrollton police officer for how, how long were you a police officer up there? Um, all total, and I was with Port Aransas Police before that. Port Aransas? For just a short while. I mean, all total, uh, 30 years law enforcement. Really? The best fishing trip I ever had is Port Aransas. We went out with a boy out there, and it wasn't one of the regular boats, you know, and he was, I guess he was, he was a boat captain, but he got fired for some reason, and uh, he took me and another boy out, and we went up, and uh, I heard him on the radio, He's, it was a gas rig up there, mm -hmm. and we heard him say, they're hopping in the boat, and we pulled up there, that gas rig, and those kingfish were completely coming out of the water and diving in, and it was just like one hook up after another. It was the best time I've ever had in my life. That's awesome. And then we we chunked the, the heavy stuff away and started doing it with lightweight in there. And we there limped it out, you know, just, I mean, and it was just a perfect Yeah, day. anytime you can get in that light tackle saltwater stuff, that's a blast. Oh, yeah. And then he took us out for free the next day in the bays, and we, we caught redfish and trout. I mean, it's a super deal that we yeah. had. I think we were about... I think it's about six hundred bucks for that that one day, you know, and and because it's been ten years ago, you know, yeah. at least or twenty. Right. But uh, anyway, I thought that was pretty neat. I mean, what made you decide to go guide? Well, Jimmy, I, I guess it was in the late eighties. I started fishing Lake Fork with some coworkers, and uh, then uh, oh, I guess it was yeah, maybe eighty nine. I was on day shift patrol. And a guy flagged me down. He was lost. He was over in Carrollton. And uh, it was our mutual friend, Ken Ravel. He was looking for a, he just bought a new boat and he was looking for a company that was going to put his TX numbers on. Right. So uh, anyway, that kind of kicked off a relationship, friendship. And we started, yeah. started fishing over here. And Ken, Ken had already had several years experience here. And yeah. So we, we, we fished together over here. And, well, Ken knows just about everybody in this business, you boy, know. Isn't that the truth? It's amazing, you know, and, and I like talking to him, but that boy can go on for days. <laughs> you, you know, it ain't a short conversation, you know, but he knows so much about the lake and, and about he tackle does. and that sort of thing. And, uh, Everything about fishing, and he's just, yeah, he's a, he's a great guy, super nice guy. Oh, yeah. But uh, anyway, I was looking, and, and I, what brought my attention to you is it looks like you've had a really good year this year. And I don't know, is that a normal year for you or what? Yeah, I mean, this is Lake Fork's amazing, and it continues to amaze me and my clients. And Well, I, I pulled up, you know, I started, I was gonna, just going to take a few of those pictures. The more I got in, I thought, I need that one, I need that one. You know, finally, I gave up. I took so many of them at... Uh, let me see if I can pull some of them up here. I think I got your website up here that uh, uh, that I was just looking through all the fish that you have gone through. I don't know if all these are for the. For the I I'm sure not all of them. There's there's one or two says a year ago or something. But uh, right uh, there's some there's some very nice fish in the, in this area right here, and I've been seeing it going on since the first of the year. You know, I had, of course I haven't been looking all year just just since January when we started doing these videos and stuff, but. Uh, just, you just like you've had some good trips out there, but uh, I, is there any particular part of the lake that you you concentrate on? Or? Not really. I mean, we fish east, west, north, south, just depending on the, you know, time of the year pattern that's going on. Yeah. Well, you started out in Running Creek. I know this year you were doing some work up in there. Yeah, definitely, seen. definitely up in uh, Running Creek, Glade. Yeah. You know, like I, I do start in, you know, the just like everybody else. When it's early season, you know, you're up north. You were actually north of the bridge, I think, up north of uh, these bridges up here. You were back right further for the other. That's right. I get up in there. Now, Bob Roberts fishes up there, too, you know, and he was he was fishing back up and along in here, and I don't know where you guys were. Some people hit this point out here and that sort of stuff. Right. But, uh, I mean, back at that time, I mean, are you fishing shallow water? Is that right? Right, yeah. Get up there, even in like Cades Lake or early season up there. In the, Cades Lake. Where's Cades Lake? In? On, the, on the northeast on the northeast side. I see. East of, east of uh, Coffee. Back over in here? Yeah, right over there. Yeah. All that area in there, just that area, you know, warms up at shallow water. Right, it yeah. warms quicker. 
You talking about this little lake right here, or a different one? Yeah, Crane Lake. I think that's Crane Lake. Cave's yeah. Lake. Yeah. Yeah. So you get a lot of spawning fish back in that. that oh yeah, park, early park season. Right there. Yeah. Yeah. Going there with a bladed jig or a, a you know red lipless crankbait. Yeah. Just cover water. Yeah. Well, Kerry Stafford he used to fish that that side of the lake a lot, you know, and uh, yeah. uh, he, he liked that area, that whole bunch there. But, uh, and, and then also that little fence row down here along here. You ever fish that fence row? Yeah, oh yeah. I mean, that's a... That whole bank there has got points and pockets, mm -hmm. and creek channel bends and that whole area. Yeah. So what's the secret, I mean, of catching all those fish like that? You know, uh, like I said, those two lures I was talking about in patterns, but I mean, I. I love the summertime too. The summertime bite on big worms. Yeah. Big shaky heads. Oh yeah. That's what I that's what I really like to do. Well this was a weird year anyway for the spawn. Yeah, and the weather, yeah. We just it, it was a different year. We'd start to get hot in the summertime and uh, then all of a sudden, you know, we had some rains or cool off and Right, yeah. You know, you well maybe you find the eggs and fish in June, you know, it's right. it's uh, it's just very oddball that uh, I think the temperature and the water runoff maybe pushed everything back, I guess, is what the deal is. It's yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it seemed like this year the, the best post-spawn bite we had going on a lot of times was uh, drop shot rigs. Oh, yeah. Huh. So is it normally in the shallow waters or the deepers, or does it make it just the different times of the day? Or? Yeah, I mean, post-spawn and the drop yeah. shot, we're, we're usually targeting, you know, deeper water, say, 16 foot and, mm -hmm. and over road beds bridges right yeah points yeah shell beds so you do fish some shell beds oh absolutely yeah. so that's that's a big deal i mean that's a key word out on fork is shell right. beds you know and right. uh, i've heard so much about it and we had uh mike mcfarland came in here and did an interview and yeah uh, we got i think a couple of shows out of it and uh and I think that's pretty much all he fishes usually, uh, except during the really cold winter and the dead of summer, you know. I think uh, those temperatures and, and wind conditions mm -hmm. don't make it that good. But, uh, right. I mean, he was saying that you've got to have uh, water flowing. Is that is that kind of what you, I mean, you've got to have wind. Definitely got yeah, wind. It stirs up the, the plankton and it gets the whole, uh -huh. you know, ecosystem going right yeah you know i'm doing volume two of this book and i'm uh, i probably won't be able to do it for the book but i was thinking uh we should at some point in time uh concentrate on some of the better fishing areas you know like uh more well known and and really try to discern where those shell beds actually are on those places because to me and i may be wrong about this you would think that that might actually be a place that when you're fishing that thing you really should know where that is right because that may actually be a a, a key to you know mm -hmm. catching fish but uh, yeah they're good I mean they're, they're good pre-spawn locations because fish will feed and pull up on those you know pre-spawn and then again post-spawn oh yeah yeah so just because you fish you know, you're catching them and then you're not catching them later on the next time you come out you know just keep checking them yeah he I mean, he actually liked the post-spawn seemed like better because the fish were, I guess they were, uh, they weren't as, uh, I mean, they would come off tired. You know, mm -hmm. they've been on spawn, they come right. off tired, and they make mistakes during that time. So, Well, they just, they're putting on the feedback because they're not focused on eating during the spawn. Yeah. And that, when, when it's post-spawn and once they get out on offshore or on those shell beds, they're ready to chomp. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah, you better be ready. Yeah, they, uh, he said that he got, he got more numbers during that time than during the, the pre-spawn but you can catch some really big ones you know pre-spawn on it whether it's yeah cranking or you know, whatever you like to do big big swim baits yeah you know, shell beds and pre-spawn you better have a net ready <laughs> well i was telling you wife there that uh this place has a history that we've never really even talked about it's yeah this this and where we where we broadcast it or film this. Martin Studios. Martin Studios. <laughs> and uh, give you a little history about it. Back in the 50s, this house, it was built by an oil man back in the 50s, you know. And then he he ended up selling the house for some personal reasons. And a company came in here and turned this into the Shed Steakhouse. And it was a Shed Steakhouse for years. 
that part of the house over there is the original part. And then the steakhouse people came in here and built this part, and then they built a big part in the back that was the restaurant part. Mm. And what it would be is you'd come in this door, this would be the entrance door, and that was kind of the house part. And so you'd walk straight back, and it was all you could eat steak for, for years. And everybody in Longview ate in this place. And it was really good. They had these special plates that you could hear them coming. They would sizzle. And it was kind of like a... The women wear, would wear the German type outfits, you know, and uh, you know our our senior class had their senior dinner here, you know. Wow. Uh, then uh, they, for some reason, sold a business. I think they had a couple of other businesses in town, and yeah. I think they were still in the restaurant business. But they got out of this business, and they sold it to a bunch called the East Texas Chicken Ranch. <laughs> You can kind of get to I get you can probably guess what this was. It was the Texas's only totally nude steakhouse. Wow. And for a short period of time, right, for a short period of time, that's what they did here. And uh well anyway, this rocked on about a year, year and a half. They got crossways with the city of Long Beach down there, and people actually started picketing this place. And if I had to run these people out of town in about 1994, I think it was. Hmm. And, uh, I mean, they were doing topless car washes outside. So, uh, but in this magazine, they got, this is Texas Monthly Magazine, 1996, I think it was. They got the Bomb Steer Award for this house. And they mentioned it in here and how, how the city of Long Beach ran these people out of town. But, uh, so that's, you're in a den of iniquity. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> but Longview Trivia. Longview Trivia. So, I mean, that, this is a crazy area down through here anyway because uh, there were some crazy things happening in, uh, I guess it was the 70s where the, uh, uh, they actually prosecuted the Greg County Sheriff and the police uh, captain of Longview for gambling and all kinds of stuff. And actually the house next door was, I think they were tied into it. They had a, they had a, I mean, well, it was a house. I mean, it's, now it's a oil company. Now that place is gone, but uh, mm. they were, they were doing all kinds of stuff down there. And uh, I think John Hanna out of the Tyler's the one that prosecuted all this. And, wow. and I ended up knowing it most of the people that was involved in that thing because my dad was in the concrete business, you know, and we, you know, you run into all kinds of people in the concrete business. Sure. But, uh, good and bad. And uh, and I actually worked with one of the policemen at uh, wrestling matches, you know, that got sent to federal pen. Wow. <laughs> so, so, I don't know, it's, it's just a crazy thing, you know, this area down here. But So yeah. this, is, this house is really not as bad as probably some of the other stuff that went on. But uh, anyway, we... My wife was looking in the paper one day, and she says, I found us a house. And I says, well, we wasn't looking for a house, you know. <laughs> it's the way it normally works, right? And uh, she says, I don't know where it is. I took one look at it. I says, well, that's a chicken ranch. And she said, well, we, can we go see it? And I says, yeah, sure, because I figured it would be pretty much toast, you know. And uh, we came out here, and uh, uh, I'm looking. The back back there was terrible. It was about 200% moisture content. But the inside of the house wasn't too bad. Well, I'm looking at Haydock block walls and cement floors in the back and a steel roof, and I thought, you know, you put a roof on this thing and get rid of all the water, it's not too bad. And it was a really great price, and the location is wonderful too. But, uh, well, <laughs> that's how we ended up with She bought this thing on uh, Valentine's Day. Interesting. So uh, we had one real estate guy that came all the way out here to tell us that he wouldn't appraise it because it was a den of, a, of a ill repute or whatever it was. And I mean, it's like it's a house, you know, it's a right. it's brick and stone. I mean, you know, those people, that's all gone. But uh, at any rate, we we worked on this thing for several years, trying, right. trying to get every, all the, you know, the bad things out of it. And uh, this room here didn't look anything like it does now. Yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, it had fist holes punched in the wall and, uh, uh, just and actually the wood wasn't even in here uh, but we could tell where the wood used to be mm. and I'd been in here before you know and uh, 
I never did come in here during the chicken ranch days. I, I kind of regret it. I would like to have seen what it looked like, but uh, uh, we did, you know, during the, our, our senior uh, banquet out here, did see it. And a lot of other people did too. But, you know, everybody, we always have come, people come up here and, and they'll say, yeah, I've been in here before. And they always say, but it was during the Shed Steakhouse. <laughs> Clarify it, right? Right. right. <laughs> but, but yeah, that's a that's a little bit of history there. Neat. Yeah, so, yeah very uh, interesting. So Jimmy, I brought some some stuff to show oh, kind of what yeah, I good. what I do. But mainly summer, summertime. What we've been catching them on during the summer. This is kind of my this is my go to rig, go to worm. Oh yeah. Wow. That's a VM J Mag worm. It's ten and a half inches. Uh huh. Straight tail. It's got a flat side on it. And it just moves a lot of water when you they show it out. When, right. when you sink. When it sinks. Oh that's a, that's a good looking bait. So where are you fishing in the deeper water right now? Is that what you're doing? Yeah, now, now we are. But I mean this thing this is a V and M mega shaky head. Uh -huh. That's a three quarter ounce. This one happens to come on, they come in different weights. And uh, it's got a screw lock right there right yeah and it's got that flat head but now we'll we'll throw this on uh, even the, on the shell beds and you can you can kind of count the shell you just kind of keep it clunking along mm -hmm. and uh, we'll catch fish on it in six seven foot of water in those shell beds you just just depends where they're at you know if they're they're up there feeding and if it gets tough you can throw this thing out there and, um, you know when you do get a bite on it the thing I recommend is not setting the hook right away on them it's a big worm as you can see oh yeah so what I tell people is just drop your rod tip, take up the slack, and then yeah. hit them as hard as you can. Huh. But, you know, when you first feel them, they might just have the back of that worm. Well, that's right. You yank it right out of his mouth. Yeah. You... But we'll throw that out there on road beds. Well, that's a big bait. Road beds, timber. Yeah. You know, anywhere big fish live on four, they, they, they love that thing. You can throw yeah. it on a Texas rig. If you're getting really thick stuff, just put a bullet weight on that thing. You can throw it on a Carolina rig. Uh, you can even put a... Um, split shot, hmm. give it just a slower fall. If you yeah. got suspended fish and around some trees, that's a real killer way, especially when they're high pressure, no wind. And then they make a junior version of that called the J Mag Junior. You know, that's what I throw on a drop shot. A lot of oh, guys yeah. will throw it, you know, a small worm on a drop shot, but it's, uh -huh. like, it's like four. So, you know, I mean, that's a that's a killer bait on a drop shot here. What color do you call that? You know? That's that's my favorite. It's plum apple. Uh huh. Plum apple or red bug seem to be the, the yeah. deal in the in the summertime. So you you you, you do this with a drop shot? That what yeah, on the drop shot rig, hmm. and uh, you can you know you can throw lighter line on your tougher high pressure days. But there, you know if you're in an area where you got heavy cover and you know and big fish, especially if it's early and late, I, I'll use a twenty pound leader and maybe a half ounce weight or something. Mm -hmm. Call it a power shot, you know, and a, and a bigger hook. I like an owner cover shot. About a four aught hook. Yeah, I always like using those longer hooks. Oh yeah, they're really sharp and it's just a long, straight shank. And then another thing I do um, is around shallow vegetation, weeds, uh, lily pads, and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, a lot of times, if, they're, if you know they're not, eat, if people want to throw a frog, and if they're not, if you're missing fish, or that maybe they're just not coming up and blowing up on frogs, but you know you're around some shallow fish. Yeah. Is this V&M Thunder Shed. Oh, yeah. yeah. And what, what I do, I take a Gamagatsu 5 Super Superline hook, which is kind of a heavy gauge hook. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the deal on that, you don't, want any, you don't want any bend in the hook, but it's also a heavy gauge hook. It gives you a little uh, weight to throw the bait, and it keels it and kind of keeps it from rolling. You can use a real small screw-in bullet weight, too, if you want to, or yeah. a... Or a or a, um, a hook with a weight on the shank. Um, if you do put a screw in hook, a screw in weight in the front of it, you want to seat your hook a little deeper in the bait first, you know, to get, leave your room to screw, uh -huh. screw in your bullet weight. Yeah. But anyway, I'll throw this where, where everybody wants to throw a frog, throw this thing, throw it all the way to the bank if you want to. And then I just like to crawl it, keeping the tail moving, keep it on the surface. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems to draw fish, draw strikes. Like I said, if they're not coming up on a frog, um, you'll get some jarring strikes. And it's but it's like a frog when you do get a blow up, don't hit them right away. I just just keep reeling, 
Oh, yeah. Pull the rod, loads up, and then you set it just as hard as you possibly can. What color would you call that? That's a that's a light hitch. Light hitch. Yeah, light hitch. You it's know, if I think color. of an old shad, if they're, um, you know, early season, I might even throw green pumpkin. I mean, if they're, like when the bluegill are spawning, I'll, I'll, uh -huh. I'll uh, dip the tail in chartreuse yeah. and throw a green pumpkin. But, you know, in the fall, they're, they're up there, the shad will start moving from now till, you know, later in the fall, the shad are moving up shallow. And if they're on shad, I like to throw a shad color. Bag. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I'm telling you, I just, I seem to, I also seem to get better hookup ratio than a frog with that technique. I just throw it in a slop, yeah. And uh, you want 20 pound fluorocarbon or a braided line because it's a, you know, it's a power technique in the weeds and yeah. you got to winch them out. Well, it looks like you've been getting a lot of women uh, guide trips. Is that right? Yes, I have. Yeah. It's great. You know, we, uh, that's funny. We, we don't have any guide. Uh, you know, you're a member of the, club, of, of the Lake Fork Maps, you know. I Absolutely. guess it's okay to say that. Oh, heck yeah. Well, I, 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 I was wondering if I already didn't tell anybody about it because I don't want anybody, you know. Uh, oh, wow. I recommend it. Yeah. Okay. Great. You know, I've sent people to you. So. Well, I know you have, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's just, you know, you always try to, out of courtesy, not, you know. No. Uh, yeah, man. Uh, but uh, we have no women members, you know, and being Bob been kind of brainstorming that and wondering how we could get some members. Right. I was thinking maybe he could take his shirt off and we'd get a little bow tie. <laughs> <laughs> but so far, he's, he hadn't gone for that. <laughs> yeah. No, I think it's great. I mean, I, I love that you know, guys bringing their wives. I've had women come by themselves yeah. and people bringing kids. I, I mean, family trips, it's... It's all great. Well, didn't they used to have a good bass and gal club in, at Fork at one time? Because I, I know Sherry so. Rustlick. Did right. you ever know Sherry? Not personally. Just heard of her for years. Well, I, she was a bass and gal, I'm right. pretty sure. And, and as a bunch of those girls up there would do that. But right. uh, that's, uh, you know, I would like to see that happen for Fork, you know. But uh, yeah. uh, it's, you know, it just amazes me some of the, the backgrounds of people that, that are up there. That, right. Uh, it's like we... Uh, I, made, I, I interviewed a guy yesterday, uh, trying to think his name. Uh, he actually, his dad was grandfather, his grandfather was the uh, uh, the chairman of the board for Skeeter at one wow. time. Yeah, and he got to know, he grew up in Shreveport and uh, knew Cotton Cordell and, and a bunch of big name H&H. H &H. H, H stayed over there, started wow. over there, you know, and all yeah. that, you know, but... And it's, and it's weird some of the things that I've I've learned just this year about people that that are up there. You know, mm -hmm. Sherry Russell Link. She was a she actually was an aeronautical engineer, and I think she worked on the B one bomber. Wow! And then there's another guy that that had a recording career with Sony. Wow! And walked away from it to really? be a guide on Fork. Yeah, huh. it was was opening for some big name acts. Yeah. You know, but it just it just got too much for him. He said, "You know, I've had all this, and you know, a lot of people their dream is to do what you do and what some of these other people are doing right now. And uh, it's just a, a matter of people learning what they really like and and right. jumping off the big end like that. And I mean, you you spent a career as a, uh, as a police officer, you know, so you probably had some pension or something like that as a result of it, and couldn't right. afford to do that." But guiding actually pays pretty good now, doesn't it? Yeah, it can. I mean, it, it, it's it's a really... Bass fishing is just a great thing. It brings so many people together, you know? Yeah. All walks alive. It's something you can do with all ages, and it's just a fantastic sport. Yeah. Well, there's there's no shortage of guides up there. There's, I'm going to think there's about 150 of them up there, full-time right. guides, isn't it? A lot of, lot of great, great fishermen guide them. Right, yeah. yeah. Everybody's got something to share and teach with people in different styles and strengths and so yeah. it's it's a great place to learn from everybody you know well i'm i'm learning as i go still you know i've been up there since uh well i've been like longer than i can remember you know yeah. going up there and i and i still learn as as i go you know, oh heck the, yeah the shell bed thing that's that's something just kind of threw us off for a loop you know uh trying to trying to learn that right. too but uh and a lot of it has to do with the, the grass loss, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. and it sounds like they're working on trying to get some of that back to where they're trying to 
built some little guards for them, seeing experimenting with that, you know, right. and see how that does. And, and that's why shell beds, I guess, have become so much more important now. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, it's kind of been an evolution from grass to that, but grass has really come back on fork in some spots. So is it? Yeah. Okay. Well, I always, always loved that. You know, we used to fish Martin Creek down there. And right. You ever fished Martin Creek? A long time ago. I mean, it was, that's all it was, was grass. Right. I, and that was, that was so good. And right. then they, they killed all the grass out there. And I actually hadn't been back since, you know, and I just hadn't been able to go down there. But yeah. You had fish it different then, you know, and. Uh, kind of like Purtis Creek. Remember Purtis Creek back in the day? Yeah. Yeah. Full of grass. Yeah. I, I never fished it, but I've heard of it, you know. Yeah. But, uh, uh, but yeah, that uh, Fork Fork is just a different animal. That uh, it's a community of people, and and I always try to, I always try to compare Ray Roberts to Fork, but they don't have the backing that, that Fork has, you know. Yeah, and uh, it's just a world famous place, you know. It really is, you know, and uh, you know, uh, I keep going back to Roberts because it's shaped a lot like Fork. You, you ever fish Roberts? Oh there? yeah, I mean that's a good, it's a good fishing lake. When it first opened, yeah, I fished yeah. it a lot. I'm, I mean, I was but, always coming over here, always had a weekend place here. But, well, you were closer to it than I was. But, if yeah, I was close so. to it. So we, we did fish it a lot. But yeah, but it, isn't it amazing? Anywhere you go in the country or the world and you run into bass heads, they know about Lake Fork. <laughs> bass heads. <laughs> <laughs> Dead heads and bass heads.